natural world around her, from wild coastal landscapes to quaint garden allotments, Alice Fox can be described as a natural fibre artist. With sustainability at her core, Alice is a process artist. She experiments with materials found and foraged, gathered and grown. She listens and responds to the materials, unassuming of where their elements will lead her work, as they come together in different combinations to create grouped surfaces and structures. Her body of work is diverse, with pieces ranging from stitched eucalyptus leaves to rust-stained tapestries, woven grass baskets and hand-bound books, their pages marked by plants, tea, walnut ink and stitch. With a background in nature conservation and physical geography, Alice's love of science is evident in her experimental approach to her artwork as she manipulates the materials, learning about their properties, boundaries, and unlocking their full potential. This exploration becomes a true collaboration between object and artist. Alice studied contemporary surface design and textiles at Bradford School of Arts and Media, and recently completed an MA in creative practice at Leeds Arts University. Alice exhibits, lectures and teaches workshops nationally and internationally. She is a member of the Textile Studies Group and the Society of Designer Craftsmen. I look forward to having a chat with Alice tonight from her home in West Yorkshire and hearing more about her recent body of work and current publications. So without further ado, let's get chatting with the lovely Alice Fox. Hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Have you noticed that when people describe you, and I noticed this when I was like doing a bit of research on you and put some posts out about you coming up, people describe you as the lovely Alice Fox. Have you noticed that? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. No, I haven't, but um, hopefully it's true. <laughs> I think so. I think so, absolutely. I just thought it was just this common thread that I picked up on and I was like, yes, <laughs> I can definitely see that. So welcome. <laughs> Um, so you're coming all the way from England in Yorkshire? Yes, from my kitchen. From your kitchen. It's an awesome kitchen. I was just having a little um, sneak peek behind the scenes and you'll have to show people your rainbow bookshelf if I pop you on full screen. <laughs> go on. <laughs> there There's my cookbooks. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> having a bit of fun with them. Yeah, they're absolutely beautiful. So how are things in, in England and, and your part of the world at the moment? Um, so right now it's raining. It's quite a dreary autumnal day. Um, uh, but if you mean wider, in a wider sense, in terms of lockdown and things, um, uh, kind of tiring and exhausting, really. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it seems to be going on a long time. And I think now we've got the winter ahead of us. That's slightly depressing. Uh. Yes, we've just come out of winter. Um, it wasn't easy, but at the same time, it felt nice to be bunkered in during that time as well. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I you can know, see. Sort of I think. Um, I think the over the summer, you know, the fact that we could still see people outside, and and you know, particularly um, thinking of my kids, you know, being able to go for walks with friends and so on, was was really good. But that's obviously going to be harder in yeah. the coming months. So, mm. yeah. Now we're going live tonight through Facebook and usually people's comments come through. Um, so if you are watching, try and pop a po try and pop a comment in the chat button, but I can't see any coming through yet. And I can see that we've got about 28 people or so watching. So if you do have a comment or a quick question for Alice, please pop it in the comment section and hopefully they'll start to pop up. Oh, Noni. Hi, Noni. <laughs> Oh, well done. Welcome to Fibre Arts Tech. Oh, so lovely. So oh. Noni is my mother-in-law and she's oh, um, the one of the business owners at Fibre Arts Australia who run the workshops mm -hmm. here in Australia, which is beautiful. So, and, oh, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Oh, hello. Ah, oh, Denmark. I was wondering where Elizabeth's part of our Fibre Arts Take Two um, community, and I was wondering where her work was from. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Carrie's one of our regulars. Carrie is a gorgeous a textile artist. So, um, hello, Carrie. Thank you so much, guys, for saying hello. I was um, worried that the comments weren't going to come through. So that's great. I'm glad that 
Alice can start feeling some love. <laughs> so, Alice, how did you come to be a professional artist? Because you weren't, you didn't start off that way. No, I mean, I suppose I've been creative all my life. I, I mean, I spent my childhood making stuff in my bedroom and things. But um, my my first kind of passion, if you like, in a professional sense, was um, nature conservation. Um, so my first degree was in physical geography. And um, and then I worked for the Wildlife Trusts um, for a few years in the UK. And um, it was it's actually otters that um, that were my passion. So I was absolutely obsessed with otters. Do you have otters in Australia? Um, no, I don't think you do. No, um, no. but there are, there are thirteen species of otter all over the world in other parts of the world. Um, I was completely obsessed with otters, and that was what I wanted to do: was work in otter conservation. So that is what I did. Um, so after my geography degree, I worked first as a volunteer and then as a paid um, member of staff on otter conservation. Um, so yeah, that was that was my my life really. Um, and I did creative stuff on on the side of that. Um, and then when I had children, um, that, that work became less um, compatible really with family life. Um, so I left that job and I suppose having small kids around and kind of getting back into creative stuff started me thinking a bit more about pursuing that. Um, and I did an adult education class um, uh, on a just on a Friday afternoon locally, and that's what got me specifically into textiles. Um, so having done that for a couple of years, I thought I really would like to study this further and, and then went to do a degree um, at Bradford, uh, Bradford College near me. Um, and I did that over five years, so it was part time for most of it. Um, and then I've been working freelance as a professional artist ever since. Mm, that's amazing. And to take that leap of faith and just go all in with your arts. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of, um, it just fitted, I suppose. I mean, life life has twists and turns, doesn't it? And it, so it wasn't mm. necessarily part of a grand plan. But I also think actually when I chose to go to do geography, I was quite torn at that point between going to art college and doing the geography. And, and that, you know, geography seemed a, a perhaps a more sensible route, um, more of a kind of obvious professional route. So, and I kind of knew that art was something I might come back to later on. Um, I mean, it never went away, but um that's that's what I've, I've done so yeah and yeah. but I also I don't regret doing it that way at all because the, the all of that experience that I had um through the physical geography and um nature conservation and so on that really underpins the way that I work now um so and also you know just in terms of transferable skills having um you know now I do talks and things for groups and I used to have to do that in my old job so as soon as I finished my textiles degree and I was being asked to do things like that, I was able to because I'd done it before. Um, so I kind of hit the ground running, I suppose, after that. Yeah, that's fascinating. One thing I looked up was that your dad was a geography teacher yeah. and your mum, I think you described her as an amateur botanist. And yeah. I just yeah, thought how beautiful but she um professionally but she um has yeah she would she's a a keen plants woman and um so yeah family holidays were kind of a mix of geography and geology and plants and birds and um so I just kind of absorbed all of that really yeah do you, they must be very proud of you like you like the perfect combination. <laughs> well, I don't know if you say that, but uh, yeah, they are. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did your influence or the influence that your parents potentially had on your life and your career so far, does that influence how, how you maybe parent your kids? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily conscious, um, conscious parenting decisions. It's just that's who they are and, and that's the, the kind of family upbringing I had. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, and, and I was, as I say, I've, I've had a change in career. So things, things kind of twist and turn. Um, mm. I mean, my kids are used to me, you know, with kind of materials all over the house and, um, picking up weird things in the street and, you know, they've just grown up with it. So 
um, sometimes that's embarrassing, you know, when you're a teenager and you're going into a parent's evening at school and you're picking stuff up on the path on the way in. Um, that's <laughs> the most embarrassing thing in the world. But but um, <laughs> my daughter's now at, at university studying draw, drawing. Um, so, but I mean, I would be equally supportive of anything she was doing, whether it's creative or not. So, um, yeah. yeah. I, I it was kind of a selfish question because my daughter loves art and she's really good at it. You know, she's just really good at it. Every time she gets her paints out or drawing, she, I, I secretly go, oh, I wonder if she'll be an artist. But <laughs> well, like yeah, but you said, you're an artist whether it's your profession or not, yeah. can't you? And um, yeah, I mean, good point. you know, maybe maybe parents of artists or aspiring artists just worry about the fact how they're going to make a living. I mean, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there are pros and cons, I think. There are pros and cons. What were your turning points for your arts career? So, I mean, you're right. Like, from what I've heard, people don't get into this business for the, you know, huge financial gain. Um, no, but that, but that's the same with my first job. I mean, yeah. I, you, know, you don't go into nature conservation for the money. Um, you don't work yeah. for the money. So um, I, I, as far as I'm concerned, you do what you're passionate about and what you feel is is going to make a difference to the world um, and makes you happy. And, um, you know, if you can find a way of making a living through that, great. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's great advice for any kids out there too. So just find something that makes you happy and that you're passionate about and, yeah, the money will come. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to believe that. <laughs> what What have been? Do you find like so? You've been a professional artist for ten about, years, about a decade. Yeah, yeah, about a decade. Did you find it harder in the beginning, or now that you're more sort of established and you have that following? And what for you feels like maybe your turning points within your career and what was it like getting started and how does that compare to where you are now? I guess that's the question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, as I say, I, I did kind of hit the ground running when I finished my textiles degree. Um, I had I had some opportunities that were really great that I made good use of um, and those have really kind of led to all sorts of things. I mean, the, the, it, it's a re it really is a struggle when you, you come out of a, a degree, come out of study, and you're kind of in the wide world. Um, and, it, and it's hard. Um, and you never really know whether you're doing the right thing. Um, I suppose I'm probably quite, um, I'm, I'm pretty focused. I, I knew that I wanted to be self-employed. I wanted that. I wanted to make that work around my family rather than go into a, a job um, in design or whatever. Um, so I was just quite determined to make that work. Um, and I, I created quite a lot of opportunities. I think, I think one of the things people ask me about whether, um, you know, advice for people starting out. And um, I, I feel like um, it's not a case of waiting for things to come to you. You've got to make, certainly in those early days, you've got to make your own opportunities. So, I mean, I, I created um, a big project that I did at, at um, Spurn Point Nature, Nature Reserve in East Yorkshire. So the, I did this res residency the following year from graduating. Um, and that was, a, looking back on it, it was a massively um, ambitious project to do in the first year after graduating. And I kind of can't believe I did it really. Um, but it just, you know, I wanted to do something that would kind of get me started. Um, I got Arts Council funding for that massive learning curve in in that that whole process, um, but again that that getting it that put a real stamp of approval on what I was doing. It gave me a kind of um, mm. uh, it, it, yeah, it it gave a sort of a real legitimacy to what I was doing. Um, so I'm not I'm kind of drifting away from your original question now. No, um, but that's great because I'd love to delve more into Spurn and and, and yeah. Your, yeah. Um, what you did and yeah you just, just going back to the question you, about how that compares to now um yeah i mean i still feel like i'm kind of making it up as i go along you know it might you, you might not it might not appear that way but but that's how it tends to feel um 
you kind of there are always things that you're always getting knockbacks. I mean, I, I've applied for stuff this year that I've not got into, and you know that kind of thing is is happening all the time at whatever stage of your career you're in. And you just have to every time it happens, you have to pick yourself up and think, well, okay, that that wasn't the right time for that, and move on and try other things. Um, I think partly it's about recognizing what's right for you what's right for your practice because just because other people are doing certain things it doesn't mean it's the right thing for you um, so I think what comes with that with time and experience is is a confidence perhaps in your own work um, but then you're always feeling unconfident as well so um, maybe it's also just learning to project confidence rather than the uncom the, 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 the non-confident bits I don't know um, so yeah, does that, I think that maybe answers the original question. Um, yeah, I think so too. I think it's, I think you're right that it's always a journey and like, and I don't know who said it, I'm not great at details, but uh, there's something really beautiful about always being the amateur. You know, there's a gorgeous quote about being, you know, you never really want to be the professional, you always want to be the amateur and always learning and discovering and not afraid to make mistakes and um, you really have that hunger and drive, so. Yeah, and I think we should always be learning, you know, whatever, however experienced you are, um, we should always be learning. Um, you've never yeah. finished, have you? <laughs> no. Learning. Yeah. And I read that when you, so Spurn Point and your residency there went for six months, but when you originally asked for arts or when you originally um, applied for the Arts Council funding, it was turned down. Yeah, right. so, um, yeah. so that project kind of came about. I, um, when I was finishing the degree, we were obviously encouraged to kind of look at what we were going to do next. So I started planning this project. I thought I wanted to do something that was um, uh, based on a you know, on a landscape, kind of bring in some of that previous experience to to the way that I was working. So I'd contacted the staff at Spurn. It's managed by Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, who I used to work for. So although I didn't know it and it wasn't a site I'd worked at specifically, I knew that it was a site that could be a really useful um, kind of focus. It's um, about two and a half dry hours drive away from here, from home. So it's not local to me, but um, I, you know, I felt it was a place I could really um, get some inspiration from. Um, so the, the the staff at the trust had kind of agreed um, to back that um, in you know in in kind in support. Um, I applied for the arts council funding and didn't get it. But by the time I'd um, got to that point, I'd already put quite a lot of other stuff in place for the project. So you, when you're applying for funding, one of the things they want to know is where you're going to show the work. So I'd had to propose to galleries work that I didn't yet know what it was and hadn't yet made. And so there's this whole kind of chicken and egg situation that you've got with those kind of applications. Anyway, so I had got a couple of galleries that had agreed to show the work. So Having then been turned down for the funding, I thought, well, I'll go ahead with the project because it was, you know, I could still make it work. Um, but then I had a little bit of um, extra advice from an Arts Council um, officer and, and was encouraged to resubmit it. And so then I did get the funding in the end. So oh. the project went ahead. So it was a six month residency. Um, so I was going over there every couple of weeks for, for two or three days. Um, and and then obviously being mum in between um and then so we had i had six months of of making a body of work had a um, really um great exhibition in the lighthouse there um at the end of that and then toured the work so that part of the funding was to tour the work around the region so that went on for another year so the whole project was 18 months in in total yeah that was beautiful and here's here's an image actually i was enthralled with why what you were saying and I'll just pop up one of the if I can there's one of the images that can you talk to us about that yeah so that's um one of the big cloths I made um so one of the things that I was really keen to do there was to use um natural color from the place but because it's a nature reserve I couldn't pick the plants I was told um, when I started the project basically you can do what you like as long as it has no impact on the site because it's a nature reserve so um I couldn't use natural dyes in a in a botanical sense um 
but there was loads of stuff on the beach that I could use. So there were things washing up, there was, there was rubbish. Um, uh, there's this constant supply of rubbish washing up, which is kind of depressing, but um, but I was able to explore quite creatively. And there was a lot of rusty stuff. So r again, rubbish, but also bits of the sea defences and things. So yeah, so s from small objects like these little bits and pieces through to big bolts and things that were part of the the groins on the beach that stop the the um, erosion and so on. So um, <coughs> I I really kind of got into using those rusty things, and that's really where I mean a lot of people know my work from through the rust um, printing and and dyeing, and that's where it kind of came from. Really, I I mean I had done some of that before, but that sperm project really got me kind of going on that. So that became the focus to make marks and color and and so on on cloth. So I made two big pieces. So that um, the piece on the beach, that that long cloth, that's about ten meters long. That was um, the the pieces were dyed using um, rusty objects from the beach, and it's also kind of printed um, a bit with objects from the beach, and that hung in one of the high spaces in the lighthouse. Um, lighthouse was six floors. It's a really um, really big um, heritage building, and the largest space in that is about eight meters high. Um, you know, properly round room. Uh, with with stairs that kind of curl, they spiral up around the outside, uh, the inside wall, but the outside of the room. Um, so this cloth hung in, inside this, that space. And then I made another big piece that was more of a kind of art quilt piece that hung up in the lamp room at the top of the lighthouse. And that was much more kind of intricate that had hand stitching and so on. Um, Is that that one? It's not that, but um, uh, that it, again, it was rust dyed with pieces from the beach. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the, those were the two two big textile pieces. And then there was a whole series of other paper based pieces like um, with rust prints and prints, uh, color graph prints from found things on the beach. Um, so those were all around the lighthouse. And I made a little series of artist books, little concertina books, which, again, were kind of displayed in different ways around the lighthouse. So I had things on all floors. Um, so when people came to uh, during the exhibition, you could kind of work your way up the lighthouse right up to the top um, to see the view, um, and uh, there were there were things in different places. So it was it was a really interesting um, way to um, to show work. I mean, it was a completely unconventional space, um, very different to showing in a gallery space. Yeah, we've put a link up for people <laughs> that are watching. Um, we've popped a link up to you wrote a blog about it and there's a lot of images on yeah, there the and um blog. Yeah. yeah yeah so um if you're interested yeah go and have a check out of that blog and have a real like it's amazing after hearing you talk about it because i've got the images in my mind of mm. of that big long piece going up the center of the the lighthouse it was incredible mm. yeah absolutely incredible what a what a fantastic um opportunity for you it was yeah it was it was amazing and and i mean to have to kind of have the key to a lighthouse for six months. I mean, it sounds terribly mm. romantic, but I mean, in mm. reality, it was um, a dirty, drafty, kind of a bit spooky kind of building. But um, yeah. but it was so exciting um, to have this place to kind of play um, yeah. in this in what's quite a wild landscape, really. Yeah, yeah it was really? incredible. Did you sleep in there? No, uh, I mean, I wasn't allowed, um, but oh. to be honest, I wouldn't really have wanted to. It wasn't exactly uh, very homely. Um, no. I think we had, there were some previous artists and residents that had camped out in there, but, um, yeah, it, technically it's not allowed. But there was a, a kind of bunkhouse just um, further up the reserve that was um, – so it's a, it's a really important place for migrating birds, so there are uh, lots of birders there. Um, and there's a bunkhouse that the birders use. So I was able to stay in that. Um, and then occasionally, if I couldn't quite face that, I'd stay in a local B&B &B a couple yeah. of times. But, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it was, it was a really great experience. Yeah, how beautiful. And have you done any other residencies since? Um, I've not done anything uh, that, on that kind of scale, um, although I kind of feel that the work that I'm doing now that's based on my allotment is, it, it, in a sense, that is a residency. It's just it's much longer term um, and, you know, I'm hoping it's, a, a, you know, properly long term. So, yeah, yeah kind of artist residence as well.
Tell us all about your allotment. I'm so, I've just been <laughs> loving watching your Instagram and just what you're creating from your allotment. And then that, just that beautiful connection to nature that you have, that you're actually growing what you're using in every way. Um, yeah. Talk us through how that came about. Um, so I took the allotment on when I, I started my NMA um, three years ago now. Um, I suppose when I first applied for the MA, I was thinking that I would find a site a bit like you know, the equivalent of Spurn and do a sort of residency based project. Um, but I started to realise that actually if I had a site that rather than having to negotiate with uh, the managers of a site, um, so much like at Spurn where I, it, it, you know, it was it was restricted what how I could work. Um, I thought actually if I have a, if I use a place that I have complete control over then I can do absolutely what I like I can pick what plants I like I could grow what I like so I started to realize actually that a, an allotment would hold the key to that um I mean I've been a keen gardener for a long time but I've been quite frustrated in having very small gardens um but also not really having the time to do much so with with kids growing up and so on it just wasn't I'd, I'd kind of liked the idea of an allotment, but didn't feel I had the time to justify it. Um, so I thought, well, if I can tie it in with my work, actually that might work. Um, so I took the plot on initially thinking, you know, it, it could just be for the purposes of the MA. And then at the end of that, I, I might not keep it, but of course I have done. And it's become completely integrated into my life. Um, so, it's run as a as a normal allotment so um and um i'm just i'm conscious i've just realized i'm conscious that that term allotment is not necessarily used all over the world so um it's a it's quite a kind of british term that um yeah. an allotment garden is basically a plot of land on a what i think you call a community garden um in australia mm -hmm. um yeah. I think and that's I, probably I, what we I mean, in America, for instance, I don't think there's the same allotment term. Again, it might be called a community garden. But basically, it's a plot of land that is kind of split up into little sections and then people individually um, rent those little plots and, and tend to grow fruit and vegetables. So I, um, I felt I really did want it to be run as a normal allotment. So I didn't want to just make it a dye garden or whatever. Um, so it's... It looks like most other people's allotments. Um, you know, you've got the kind of mix of fruit and veg. I've got fruit trees. Um, I've got beds with with um, whatever I choose to put in them each time. Um, I've got a little greenhouse and a couple of sheds. Um, and the idea was that I would explore what was there in terms of materials, whether that was kind of grown materials, but also what's in the sheds. I mean, when I took it over, there was um, a huge amount of uh stuff left by previous owners and i mean you could do a whole kind of social history project probably based on on those two sheds and what's in there um there's a huge amount of you know, um stuff going on in there which i haven't even kind of started to think about really i i suppose you you know you have to find your focus and mine is is definitely about the materiality of things rather than necessarily the the history of them it's not mm. so interested but um that you know that's my way of exploring things is is physically um so so i did a whole kind of inventory of the different types of materials and and then started to kind of explore how i might use those um and then i've really kind of um i, I mean i'm learning all the time about different possibilities once you kind of find the, a possibility with one type of material it kind of opens doors onto other possibilities um so I'm using the plants, I'm using, um, a lot of the plants I'm using are the weeds, they're not necessarily the things that are grown um, in a kind of cultivated, so yeah, so this image here is bramble fibre, so um, there's, I've got a, a big long hedge all down one side, um, which has got quite a lot of bramble in, um, so that's fibre that I can um, e extract at the right time of year, and then I can um, make that into cordage and um, use that to make things um been using um uh, yeah so that's that's the cordage uh, some samples there so we've got um top left is sweet corn um husk fiber then we've got i think it's um 
what's the next one? I think the next one is um, certainly that I'm, I'm just that they're quite similar at this distance. I can't. Oh no, it's leek. The the middle one at the top is leek. So that is um, from the vegetable beds. I had some leeks that were kind of going to seed, and I um, stripped those down and dried them off, and then um, used those to make cordage. Um, it's got a lovely kind of oniony smell. And um, then we've got daffodil leaf, top right. So there are, there are daffodils growing under the, the fruit trees. Bottom left is the bramble. So that's really quite kind of fibrous and stiff. Um, then middle bottom, we've got nettle, but that's nettle that's been gathered kind of with the fresh fiber. So there are different state ways of using um, nettle fiber. And then bottom right is dandelion stems. Um, so, I mean, these are. I'm still kind of exploring some of these different materials and and um, and, and exploring how I then use the cordage. Um, but that that making threads became a real focus um, for my activity there because obviously of my um, textile experience. Yeah, yeah. How beautiful to know that you can grow your own plant and then make your own cordage and then weave your own basket out of it or or create create something out of it I think that's just so primal and so beautiful yeah yeah I agree yeah yeah mm -hmm. would you consider yourself a low impact artist I hope so I mean that's mm -hmm. uh, low impact in, <laughs> it depends whether you're talking about um uh sustainability or whether yeah. you're about, um, <laughs> uh impact on people um but I wouldn't say that you're a low impact no, on people I make a bit of an impact on people um so yeah, de I mean, definitely, that's that's a real kind of core aim of of how I work is to is to be as low impact as possible, um, mm. and and I think in a way the 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 MA and the focus on the allotment has really allowed me to explore kind of ideas of self sufficiency in terms of art materials. That was that was really the the aim of it. Um, you know, I've been using for a you know ever since I uh, graduated, I was I was kind of working towards working more sustainably all the time but um it just i think in order to, it, to actually really be knowing exactly where all of your materials come from and be completely involved in all elements of that process to me is the kind of ultimate aim i suppose um mm. and that i mean it sounds kind of it's quite straightforward but actually as soon as you start um thinking about there's one thing making making your own cordage and threads and and then perhaps making forms with those but um i i also wanted to explore color and and so on and and drawing even yeah so um i i in terms of sourcing materials i was still buying paper and i mean that might seem a bit of a silly thing to some people of course you've got to buy your paper or you could make your own paper but actually that's not as mm. simple as it sounds in terms of um a decent surface for for doing detailed drawings on so basically what it did was that it 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 allowed me to be really questioning every element of what i was using um, and to the extent some people might say it was kind of over the top, but I just I really wanted to explore that. And um, I think having the the focus of um, the, the the course kind of gave me um, a reason and a, and a kind of excuse, if you like, to really focus on that. So it was stuff I was already thinking about all the time, but actually to really make you focus in on it. Um, that that was really great. Mm. Somebody left a comment on our on our Facebook page when I announced that we were going to interview you and they said, and I'm sorry, I forget the person's name, but they said that they've really enjoyed watching you through this process during lockdown because you've just mm -hmm. focused, you've just had that focus of just what you're doing and um, yeah, what you're growing and just that, that, I guess that intimacy as well that it hasn't been all external. It's, it's, it's very, very focused deep. Yeah. Work. I mean, we've all been forced to do that in a sense, um, but I was yeah. quite well placed to just kind of carry on because that's, all, that's how I was already working. Um, yeah. Whereas other people have been discovering kind of local detail and and what's around them. Um, I was already kind of deep into that. But I mean, it did certainly a positive that's come out of, of this year is is giving me more time just being at home and being able to to go to the allotment every day because I mean normally I'd be dashing around the country teaching and um, that all got cancelled so I was able to really spend time that I wouldn't normally be able to. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, definitely a, a, a some kind of silver lining there. Yeah, it's a double, sort of a double-edged sword, isn't it? A lot of people have felt the same way, like they're grateful for having a little bit of time off teaching, but at the same time they really miss it and, you know, um, and the income I really, that that I really miss it, but, but I also, you know, you kind of, you get into this kind of, um, I, I'm hesitating to use a negative word because I don't want people to feel that I don't like teaching. I do like teaching, yeah. but it does take you away from the focus of your practice. And I and and I really feel as an artist, I, I'm I'm an artist first, and yes, I teach, but I but that but the teaching has to come from the other. Um, and actually, the more teaching you do, the more that takes you away from the the focus of your practice. So. Um, I think it's going to be interesting for me coming out of this to to try and find a slightly more balanced um, way of of dealing with things, um, and and fi you know that time I've had for my own practice, I, I want to hold on to some of that. Um, mm. Yeah, good on you. Yeah, you deserve it. I, from what I from what I know, you, you you collaborate a lot with people and other artists, and you're part of the textile study group as well. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that maybe we're not privy oh, to. You know? Yeah, I mean, and particularly the textile study group's taken huge, huge amounts of my time this year because I was leading um, the project that we've we've been working on. So, um, and again, there was a little bit of um, fortune perhaps in that when lockdown hit, um, we were just putting together a, a book project and um, we'd done, we'd, thankfully, we'd done all the photography and everything before lockdown happened literally just before so um again not going off on the teaching trips that I was due to do in the spring actually allowed me time to spend on that which I I you know I was going to do anyway but it, it relieved a bit of stress probably um yeah so that's yeah. There's all of, always that stuff going on in the background that um that yeah perhaps other people aren't aware of yeah, tell us about the book. Tell us about the book okay. that you've been so working the, on. So the, the textile study group book. Um, yeah. And your book later. Yeah. So it's called Insights. Um, I can, I, oh, yeah, there's a picture of it there. I was just going to hold one up. Um, <laughs> so it's um, it's a really substantial, um, beautiful book. And, I, and I, I don't feel bad saying that, even though I'm biased. It really is a beautiful book. Um, it's... A, so basically the textile study group for for anyone who doesn't know is a, a uk based um group of artists who teach so so that's what makes us perhaps different to some of the exhibiting groups around we all we're all teachers um and we run a summer school every year um and we also meet together twice a year and we learn together um with with we get tutors to come in and work with us and we're learning from each other so it's it's very much about learning both uh, for us and um other people so this book is a, a, a the members have written chapters about their own practice and in some ways this this ha this kind of emerged out of um my ma as well in a sense because i was leading the project and I had been encouraged to do kind of reflective writing on my practice during the MA. And I thought this is a this is something that we could all really benefit from. And um, so the members have all written about their practices. They were encouraged to really kind of reflect on that in quite a deep way. Um, you know, it's not a, a how-to book. This isn't a kind of, oh, I go into the studio and I do this and then I do that. It's much, it's the idea is it's more. Um, much more reflective than that um, and then we so there are chapters by 24 members and then we've got um, essays written by um, other people external to the group again about um, learning and um, in different di from different aspects so yeah it's been a really big project um, so I sort of managed it with lots obviously support from lots of the members um, from the sort of project group and other people in the group. Um, and then I did the layout of the book and then we published published it um, just in September. Um, and we were hoping to launch it at Festival of Quilts in, in the summer um, in Birmingham, but um, that show got cancelled just like lots of shows. Um, and I mean, we should be showing it now in, in an exhibition as well which is you know all of that's just kind of it, it it's been shunted hopefully shunted into next year rather than completely cancelled but um so now we're just selling the book online and it's been just flying out um and i've been sending them out all over the world which is just fantastic so after spending so much time and energy on a project like this to be able to send them out 
around the world is really great. Yeah, hold hold it up, Alice, so we can see oh. a real live look at it. So it's got it's got um, images wow. on both sides um, of of all the, the yeah, and it's oh, so. Wow. It, 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 can we have a sneak peek inside? A big heavy book. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> let, me find, let me just find my chapter. Find your page. And I'll show you. Yeah. Oh, so that's. Oh wow. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, wow. The photography is fantastic. We worked with a really great um, photographer, and um, yeah, it's just it's it's glossy and beautiful, but it's also got huge amounts of substance in there, and um, yeah, hopefully, it's a really going to be a really useful book to a lot of people. Well, did you get my order today? Because I put an order in. <laughs> Yay! I'll, I got one. I'll go to the post office later. That's okay. No hurry. It's okay. <laughs> it'll get. It'll come. But um, if anyone's interested, it, it just looks like a stunning book and a beautiful resource to have. Um, we've put a link in the comments where you can buy it through the textile um study group, and it's thirty pounds and the shipping on top of that as well. But it comes to around a hundred Australian dollars, which I felt for such a sub substantial book um was really great value and a great investment yeah, I, mean, I think it, yeah. we, we've had some really great feedback from people um on, on it so um yeah, yeah. And, and I've sent quite a few off to Australia already so um, oh great that's really good I'm just checking on some oh here we go yeah so Philomena um just asked where are the books available to purchase so yeah so it's um, through the textile study group website um yeah because it I mean essentially it's a self-published book so we're doing all of that that work yeah, great. Glennis has said it's on the way yeah, to me. Ordered last week. Yours is on the way. <laughs> we were talking about that. <laughs> Somebody in, in New Zealand got one the other day, and it had taken about a month to get there. I mean, I don't know how usual that is, but um, I think things have been taking a longer time just yeah. the lockdown to to get across the world. Yeah. Um, so Susan said, "How can I get a copy of the book yet?" Yeah. Um, online, Susan, and we've put a link just um, just above your comment, actually, the textile study group. Mm -hmm. And just funnily enough, um, Susan wrote a comment earlier and she wrote, um, during lockdown in Melbourne, the local library told us we had to keep any books and the mm -hmm. only book I had was yours. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's really cool. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or just just during lockdown presumably. i would assume just during well i think we have to give our books back but yeah all the libraries shut in melbourne they're still i think they're still shut with mm. but that's okay that's that's fine it'll all open up again and we'll be mm. busy as ever won't we um uh, i'll just put a couple of comments up for you wonderful to listen to all your enthusiasm mm. and um jennifer's here Ah. Denise. Oh, hi, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Oh, that's lovely. lovely. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it is nice, isn't it? It's nice. Yeah, yeah, I wish great. we could do a big, massive and, Zoom and call. I, it's but... really nice, actually, to see where people are from because uh, often on social media you don't actually know where people are based necessarily. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I just think um, technology is fantastic. I mean, that's yeah. something I've been so aware of in lockdown, the fact that we've been able to do stuff like this and, you know, even communicate. My family have a um, – we have a weekly Zoom call on a Sunday. Just, you know, it just amaz it made such a difference, I think, yeah. to the experience, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like um... – the external public have been really patient. So, like, if technology hasn't, like, if we're doing something live, not just myself but anyone that I've noticed, like, Seth Apter goes live and he did this whole week of lives and he was having troubles with his techs. Um, but people yeah. were just so forgiving. Like, I they just appreciate it. Yeah, I think you've yeah. got to be about it and um, and then people kind of realise, yeah. And because we're all grappling yeah. with it now, you know, and, yeah. and a lot of us feel like we're on catch up with it because we didn't really know how it works. But um, yeah, yeah, we're all figuring it out. Understanding around, I think, just now, which is good. Yeah, yeah. I'll just go back, um, Madeline. The book's called Insights. Is that correct? Um, yeah, of the of your of own book, study group book. Um, yes, I want, book. maybe Mad does Madeline mean um, the book that um, that that was maybe in your Batsford book. That was probably, and... 
um, Natural Processes in Textile Art is probably the book that Sue, I think it was, was talking about, or the library yes. book. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And talking about books, you mm -hmm. created a book from your allotment, um, MA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I can yeah, so um, so that's really recent. I just released it last week, I think. Um, so it's called Plot One Hundred Five, which is the the name of the the number of my plot. Um, and it's um, when I after I finished the MA, which was a, a year a year ago now, um, I always intended to do a publication about that work. Um, these little self published books are something that I've done. A number of times now so I did the first one when I did the sperm project and um, it worked really well I really like uh, that way of sharing and I think particularly because my work isn't so much always about final pieces it's more about the process so I can tell the story of a body of work and how that's developed through a publication like this um, and then I can send them off around the world to people who've not necessarily seen my work in person. So it's something that I've really um, enjoy doing and um, have got quite um, kind of used to doing. So every time I've done a, a, a big project since then, I've published a book about it. Um, so I think this is the seventh now. Um, wow. And um, so, yeah, this one's called Plot 105 and it's got a, an essay um, which is kind of loosely based on uh, what I wrote for my MA dissertation, but it's much more approachable. It's not in kind of academic speak um, <laughs> or not so much. And um, so there's an essay that's about how I work and how I engage with the site um, and, you know, the different materials and the different sort of considerations I've had to come up against. Um, and then it's got a, um, a kind of photographic essay as well. So a whole series of photos of, again, of processing of materials and things growing and so on. Um, so yeah, so that one's available now, and and um, through my website again. Obviously, it's self-published, so in, it's it's through the website. And um, again, I'm I'm sending them out around the world, which is lovely. Um, and and all my other my past similar publications are on there too. Um, so yeah, it, it's a really it's kind of become um, the self-publishing has become quite a sort of bread and butter thing for me, really. Um, yeah. That's how that's how I kind of share. I really like sharing my work in that way. Um, I like, you know, technology is great. We were just talking about that. But um, to have a physical, tangible, tactile book in your hand that's got lovely yeah. and, and so on. Um, I, the, you know, I love that. So, um, yeah, you can never have too it's many special. books. That's, that's how I feel. I know. And that's one thing, actually, I've loved about the Zoom calls and, um, you know, our kids are still learning online. They'll, they'll go, one of them will go back next week and our eldest daughter, our, our daughter will go back in about three weeks. But sometimes I sneak in that she's doing an art class at the moment on colour theory and it's just yeah. beautiful. She, she goes to a Steiner school and it's just, mm -hmm. it's all about Goethe's colour theory and how you know blue is closest to dark and I just I just sit there and listen. I should be working but I'm, I'm listening but all the kids in the background have these magnificent bookshelves as well mm -hmm. so they must be sitting in their studies or in their lounge rooms or something but just the books were just so there's so much inspiration in the world there really is <laughs> from books to nature to rainbow kitchen books <laughs> Yeah, and you can see the sun's come out here now. You, it's a bit bright now, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, so yeah. Dry. If anyone was thinking about publishing their own book, what advice would you give them, Alice? Um, well, I mean, it's it's not rocket science. Um, I mean, any, anyone could do it, really. I think um, I, when I, the first time I, you know, the first two that I did, so the Spurn one and then the next one, which was called Gifts from the Pavement, I had some help with that. So some, I'm not a graphic designer at all. Um, and I had somebody help me with the layout of those first two. So I knew, I kind of said how I wanted it. And then she helped kind of get it in the right state for the printers. And then once I'd done those two, I thought this is something I really want to do again. I, I, I wanted to kind of learn a bit more about the process. So I had a, a quick crash course in InDesign, which is um, one of the Adobe softwares, um, with somebody for an hour. I mean, I literally have the the, the very basic, um, most basic skills in that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
so I, I lay I then was able to do the layout. Um, I probably do it very slowly and kind of in a really clunky way compared to anyone who knows what they're doing. But but I'm keeping it really simple. So again, I think that's maybe um, part of it. Keep things as simple as possible and, and they can still look great. Um, I do the photography myself. Again, every time I've done one, I've learned new things, either wow. about how to photograph things yeah. better or, you know, how to how to edit things a bit differently or whatever. So each time I've learned more. Um, and and then I suppose and you can so I, I publish them with an ISBN number and it's you know that means it gets kind of lodged um, with the British Library and everything properly but you don't have to do that that's just um, that's that's one element that you can do um, and then obviously you've got the upfront printing cost so for me the the main cost is just getting them printed um, mm. so that's obviously something that you have to be prepared for but because I've done it a number of times I now know that they will over a period of time sell um, mm. and that's become my you know a real kind of um, uh, part of the way that I, I sell things so um, I think having a decent following makes that a lot easier I think it would be a struggle if you didn't have much of a following mm. but but also or if you were you know if you weren't selling things through exhibitions so generally when I've done them I've had physical exhibitions to sell the books through so they've become a kind of exhibition catalogue um mm. this time obviously that's not the case but um um so yeah I mean it's 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 not difficult but it's not necessarily for everyone um yeah yeah I think that's great advice, though, is to just keep it simple. Mm. You know, get some get some skills behind you, or get someone that could help you. And, and yeah, the other thing is there are lots of sites now that do. Um, you know, these kind of print on demand sites. You can have books made up, and there are there's kind of software I think that 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 helps you with all of that layout stuff. I mean, I'm not doing it through that route, so I don't know much about it. But I think if people are wanting to do it on a smaller scale um, or want more support, then then there's plenty of that available. Um, these yeah. days yeah yeah absolutely i've got a couple of questions if that's okay um marilyn alice what fruit trees do you have in your garden and how have you used them in textiles okay. thank you marilyn um so i've got um a mixture of i've got apple trees i've got cooking apples i've got eating apples i think i've got about six or seven varieties of apple um and i've i've taken them to um the local rhs garden at the right time of year to get them identified so I've, I have got a list of what they are which is lovely um I've also got a plum tree and a couple of pears um and I planted a damson tree this year uh, last year so um oh I've got peach tree I've got a peach tree in my greenhouse which is really amazing because I get I get my own peaches um and it's got the most beautiful blossom um in terms wow. of them in textiles so that um I mean, obviously, that fruit gets into the kitchen, and um, you know, uh, you know, it's it's all over the place. Um, oh, wow! <laughs> the, the, the kitchen's kind of full of apples at the moment. Um, so I have I have used them a bit. So I've made um, I made a whole series of different inks. So that image that we showed a little while ago of in my studio with with drawings and and that's the one. So that grid of um, different colours there, those are all. That's a kind of map. So the the kind of central image at the um with the with the grid the, the left hand grid if you like there that is essentially a map of the plot um and each square of color there is made from different plants on the plot and they're located on that grid uh, depending on where the plants are in the plot so for instance that top uh, on that top row the left hand one on the top row is a kind of orangey color that's from the peach tree in the greenhouse um so that's from the wood of the peach tree so when i've pruned it i've then taken those prunings and i've boiled them up and i've made a um a, a basically a kind of water um watercolor based ink from that um and then you've got different things down the the left hand side there of a, a, a plants down the the hedge row so i've got there's beech um and holly down there and there's bramble and elder and things so those different shades there and then some of the other colors are are from either wood from from different trees or from leaves and and flowers in the um in the, the vegetable beds um so that's one way I've, I've made ink with with the wood from the trees and and sometimes from the leaves 
Um, one of the things that I did use the apples for, um, so there was another image um, in the um, of the, the vessel. Um, mm. Can you find the one of the little looped vessel? That's the one. Okay, so um, so that was, um, yeah, that's the one. Um, these, I made a series of these and they're called apple vessels. So they're, it's looped paper yarn. So they're, they're the size of an apple. It's formed round an apple. Um, so the yarn is quite fine. Um, and then it's been, uh, it was, it was formed round the actual fruit. And then some of the others were formed right round so that it completely enclosed the apple. And then the apple was left to kind of dry and shrink inside. So the apple is still in there. Um, this one was left like that. So this, the inspiration for these really was the, in the autumn when the fruit's dropping off the trees and you get the birds pecking the fruit and they often will leave, they peck out the flesh and they leave these kind of skins and it's like a vessel, um, what's left. And I just, I was fascinated by these. I thought they're really beautiful and wanted to find a way of kind of um, celebrating that, if you like. So I made these little vessels and then they're dipped in ink made from apple wood. So the colour there that you see is from the apple wood. Um, oh, wow. so that's probably the most obvious way I've, yeah, that, that's the way I've used the fruit trees. Um, yeah. So yeah, wow. good question. Yeah, that's amazing. That's so amazing. I love that you can um, use every single part and everything's connected. You know, there's that, that yeah. thread of nature. Yeah. It's, it's, it's completely, and I think also that um, the way that I, my practice, that it, it's all kind of integrated into the rest of life. It's, it's actually quite hard to unpick things. So the fact mm. that there's, there's all sorts of, you know, stuff from the allotment is in my kitchen. When I go to the allotment, I'm, I'm partly working on, I'm doing gardening tasks, but I'm also kind of doing tasks to do with the, the materials that are there for the work or, you know, everything is so kind of tied up. Um, and I think that's probably, um, you know, the other day, Angela, we were talking about what, what, what it is to be an artist and, and in mm. a sense for me, it's, it's not a, it's not a job. It's a, it's just a way of being really, um, everything's kind of tied up. It doesn't stop when you walk out of the studio door. Um, if, certainly for me, everything is just, it's just the way I do stuff. Um, yeah. 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 I think that's. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's very hard to separate who you are from. I've left jobs because they haven't sat well with my values as a person. I just go, I just can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I was working once as a product developer and everything was plastic and coming in from China. And I just went, I, I just can't do this anymore. This is not who I am as a person. It's not how we live our lives. It's not where I want to see the future going. And I just said, thank you so much for everything I've learned, but I, I, it, I can't come to work anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, things feel much more aligned now and I'm very grateful for the experience and, and what it taught me and I met some amazing people during that time. But, um, yeah, I feel like you've got to have work-life balance holistically. You've got to have, yeah, a holistic balance. So, um, and, yeah, if you can find a job that you're aligned with, it, it, it no longer becomes work. Yeah. No, it doesn't feel like a, a chore. I, I love it. I love it when yeah. I get time in the studio because actually I don't get that much time in the studio. Um, yeah, I'm like surprised to hear that, but yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> well, I'm not considering that you you are publishing books. You, you're working on an MA. You've got two children. You've got a lot of teaching commitments. I mean, yeah, amazing work. Um, we've got a few more questions if you don't yeah. mind. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is Alice. When you uh, when you teach, what areas do you teach in? Thanks, Philomena. Uh, is that geographical areas or or? Oh, no question. Okay. Question. Well, I could answer. Well, have so, both. Um, I mean, most of what most of where I teach is in the UK. Um, I'm not sure, Philomena, where you are, but um, I teach all over the UK. Um, generally. Um, I mean, I go. I teach in studios where I'm invited as a as a kind of guest tutor. Um, I teach down in West Dean in um, West Sussex, which is kind of internationally renowned arts college. Um, oh, techniques. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. So, I mean, it, basically, it's techniques that I use in my own work. So, um, probably the most popular workshop is um, is the rust printing one. Um, I mean that. I, I'm always amazed how people keep asking for that because I kind of think, oh, well, there can only be so many people in the world who want to learn about how to do printing and dyeing with rust. But um, there are obviously still people who who haven't yet done that. Um, 
Um, and but I do, but I, when I'm teaching something like that, it's always from my own experience. I'm, um, there are lots of different approaches to to all of these things, and I teach the way I do it. Um, not necessarily saying that's the only way, but um, I think that's the only way I can teach. Um, there are there are workshops I do which are based on using plant pl color from plants. So we do some botanical contact printing. We also do ink making, um, but then also kind of exploring recording the surroundings in different ways. There's a, a workshop I do called Landmarks, which is re I really love doing because it's um, we have like practical techniques in there for creating color from plants and things, but we also we go outside, we do walks, we record things in different ways. And then we make these lovely little books that, that bring everything together and all the different techniques. And it becomes a record of the place and our experience of that place. And, and that's a lovely workshop because, you know, I do that in different places around the country. And, and it's different every time because it's different plants, it's different people. Um, and, it, you know, the detail of it is going to be different every time, which I love. Um, uh yeah so I'd, and then i do i also do a workshop that's based on kind of 3d structures i mean my work over the last few years has become a lot more about three-dimensional small scale three-dimensional things rather than flat surfaces so um as a workshop i do that's based on that um it's always kind of shifting a little bit um i do use book techniques a lot in my workshop so although my i'm not necessarily making books all the time in my own work i find that um little bookmaking techniques are a really nice way of bringing stuff together in a workshop so people go away with something that they feel is like a finished object rather than just a pile of marked papers or cloth um yeah so it's a range wow. of range of stuff really yeah i'd like to do all of them please <laughs> <laughs> i think all of us would i think that just sounds so fun sounds so amazing um Jennifer has asked, Alice, do you explain your ink making process in your natural processes publication? Mm. Yeah, there is a there's a bit of that in there. There is a little section on natural inks. Um, it's uh, it's not very extensive, but there is a bit in there. Um, there have I have written about that diff uh, since then. So uh, there was um there's a publication called Wow Books w um, Workshop on the Web is a a, we a website that do various publications. And they get different artists to write chapters. So I did a chapter for their Wow Book Five, um, which I assume is still available online. That's got a hot, that whole chapter is about uh, making inks. Um, yeah. So I mean, there's and and there's so much. I mean, there are so many other people doing this. It's not you know, it's not only me making plant inks. And and so there's so much stuff online. Um, I mean, I, I'm realizing now that there's a whole area, there's a massive area of ink making that I haven't um, gone anywhere near to do with laked pigments. And there's so much stuff available online. So, um, yeah, do ha have a hunt around. Oh, there's a really lovely book as well by um, Jason Logan, in, in who's a Cana Canadian artist. He's in, um, he's in Toronto. And, and it is that's apt. I mean, I would recommend that to anybody who's interested in making it. That's that's brilliant. Um, yeah. really beautiful book as well as as well as informative um yeah yeah we've been we've been talking to jason um great so hopefully yeah. yeah we might actually have him on one night and um yeah and people can have yeah delve deep but um lorna crane uh one of our beautiful artists she she highly recommends jason's book as well um yeah. oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. and if you google um or if you the hashtag make ink is a really nice little one to follow too guys if anyone's interested um, and Fiona has asked, are your inks light, fast or fugitive? Thanks, so that Fiona. depends completely on what it is you're making it with. Um, I mean, just like any natural dyes, of course, some are going to be more light, fast than others. Um, things like the berries and um, uh, there are certain plants that, that have what appear to be quite vibrant pigments but they obviously don't last uh, they're not stable um but there are other things that are much more stable so um it's a real you know it's a real range um i think if you're using these kind of slightly experimental processes then you have to accept that you're not necessarily going to have the longevity of some things um i think if you want a predictable result then use conventional art materials um 
but on the other hand if you're open to you know wanting to use what's around you i think i think accepting that there may be some change um is just part of that and actually i just think if think you know we all change uh, why should ever why should we expect things to change, stay the same um but obviously there are some that are more like fast so some of some of the things that have been used for for years i mean certainly in the uk um or in this this part of the world um oak gall and ink uh, oak gall and iron ink is the traditional way that we made ink so there are manuscripts yeah. from hundreds of years ago that have, have still got that on um walnut ink is a really kind of again a really good um stable one and some of the other the the inks that i've been using um uh, wood from the trees and things um which are, are tannin based those are going to be much more stable than some of the things that we're using flowers or um berries uh, i think it's just it's just about having an understanding and, and expectations about them often uh, as well i think um you know if you are using things in in books in sketchbooks where they're not in in daylight a lot of the time then things are going to last a lot longer um so it uh, yeah there's a mixture um but i think you can't expect them all to be um to all act in the same way and also they they change depending on what you use them on so different papers have an effect the alkalinity or the um acidity of the surface that you put them on um will change shift the colors and and change things so there's so much kind of um unpredictability about yeah. about these things but I, that for me that's part of the magic and and i think yeah. that, that you can understand it's great to un, the more you understand the more you kind of know what to expect but um but but it's also kind of exciting just seeing what happens to these things sometimes but i think also just just going back to some of the, the drawing with the inks i mean there was a there was an image of um one of my drawings in the shed of a of a bean plant um in the little that's the one so that that's in my sketchbook that was just drawing um seedlings in the shed and for me doing a drawing like that it's not about making something that is necessarily going to either be seen or shown or stuck on the wall it's in a sketchbook but it's a, but to be able to use something that is literally from that site um to draw and you know there's something so completely meaningful about using a color i mean it's not necessarily the color that the thing i was drawing is you know it's not the same greens but that doesn't matter it's about um the meaning of of that of recording the site and and kind of getting to know it and yeah so yeah. Mm. not necessarily about predictable results you'll be making your own brushes soon <laughs> oh i've done that yeah you've done it oh have yeah. you it, that's a kind of it's quite a sort of standard thing isn't it at some point to make your own brushes or to use oh. different mark making tools um yeah. yeah yeah it's it's i just we've been yeah deep in with that with lorna um she's yeah, known as the brush maker part of her thing isn't it is um, oh yeah. yeah and it's just so beautiful and it just connects back to what you're doing like you know mm -hmm. you pick things up on a walk and um you mentioned about rust printing and that you so you still you know dumbfounded that people love to do it and i was just having a bit of a giggle to myself in the background because you also mentioned about you're the embarrassing mum that picks up stuff well i'm the embarrassing mum that picks up rusty stuff <laughs> yeah that, that's it that's yeah although i yeah. mean the, there's a there's a turning point i think for um for the kids there was a point when um my daughter brought me home something from she'd been walking home from school and she had picked up this washer or whatever it was and gave it to me so there is a kind of turning point that happens i think sometimes where they mm. suddenly realize oh actually that mum would like that I'm laughing because I dragged home a rusty old mattress. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't quite fit in my pocket. Not the first. <laughs> my son was like, what are you doing, Mum? And I'm like, oh, no. So I promised the ladies if I could find more rusty springs, I'll bring them and they can have them at a workshop or something. But, um, yeah, rust is great. So um, everybody has said thank you so much um, for um, I never gave um, ink making a thought before today. Great info. Mm -hmm. Um, Philomena says, thank you so much for clarifying techniques. Oh, will you do any online workshops at any stage in the future? I hope so. Yes, I am. I'm in the process of planning some um, and working towards that. But um, yeah, uh, watch this space. Yes. Denise says, um, your courses are inspiring, would highly recommend them. 
Denise has been on a couple. Um, yeah. Good on you, Denise. That's lovely. Um, yeah. So oh, thank you, Madeline. Thank you so much. Um, so who is new to me? Who massively inspired by? Oh, please come no. over. Oh, well, that's great, Vicky. Because sometimes I think that you know, you think that the that the people that you know and love, you think, oh, everybody knows Alice, but that's not necessarily um, the case, you know. But I did promise someone, one of our followers, to ask you who your favourite artists are and, and, like, what artists do you find inspirational? Mm. Yeah. Um, so, oh, God, it, it's quite hard, isn't it, <laughs> answering questions? Yeah. Um, I, I, one artist that I always use in that um question is um sue lorty so she um she's also based in west yorkshire i spent some time helping sue in her studio when i was a student a textile student and um i really i just absolutely um love the way that her approach to things and her use of materials so her i find her work massively inspiring but i also know sue and that's um really i'm really privileged to have spent some time in her studio um in terms of text other textile artists um sheila hicks is probably kind of really up there so she's that um american artist who ha she lives in in paris now i think um and she has her work over decades has just is so experimental and has she's worked on such different scales so massive scale textile pieces to kind of really intimate um experimental small pieces so i absolutely love her work um i really love a lot of other mediums so i i'm quite interested in a lot of ceramics i don't know anything about ceramics but i really like looking at ceramics there's um there's an artist now who who's not with us anymore but she's called Gillian Lowndes um and she was a really experimental ceramic artist so she was kind of collaging in with different materials and ceramics and I just find her work incredibly interesting um I love scu sculpture too I mean you know I mean I Land artists have, have obviously been a really big influence. So people like Andy Goldsworthy and um, Richard Long and, and, you know, that kind of genre. But um, but I, I really love sculpture. I don't know. I just love lots of things, <laughs> lots of people's work. Um, yeah. Oh, well, that's beautiful. There's definitely, yeah, some, some beautiful names there. I love Andy Goldsworthy as well. <laughs> I've done a few sculptures in lockdown in the local forest. <laughs> yeah, right. I'll have to send you a photo. They're, they're a bit, they're a bit amateur, but it just it was just a beautiful practice just to go and just pick up sticks and weave them in, and then before you know it, you had this big thing. And yeah, absolutely. And and he, you know, as a, when I was a teenager, I I was really kind of into his work, and then actually I went to to a lecture that he did. Um, you know quite a lot number of years ago now um i think sometimes when you hear somebody inspirational speak um mm -hmm. that can that you know you could there's one thing liking someone's work but to to hear them speak and, and actually that was the thing with sue lorty when i when i was a student i went to a lecture that she did and i just felt like she was describing the way i felt about the world and i just thought wow um you know those are the kind of life-changing um or affirmative kind of moments um yeah they? yeah that's beautiful and you mentioned before that you know there there are plenty of people out there doing ink making and there's probably you know 200 people doing rust dyeing and all the rest of it but they don't teach it in the way that you teach it and they're not you and they're not your process and i think your students and anybody's students would have that connection with if you find a beautiful connection with someone then and the energy's right then that's half the battle with learning i see it all the time with my kids you know they have that connection with their teachers it just it's like a light bulb goes on so yeah there's millions of teachers out there but yeah can... yeah and also that I mean there's such a lovely community I know when I teach one of the, the things that is that I really get out of it is that sense of community amongst students and you can you can get a, a group of people together who none of whom have met each other before and um and then there's this kind of shared discovery and people people getting to know each other over the 
dive at or the the steamer or whatever and um over lunch and then they go away after three or four days and they're best of friends and and keep in touch and there's there's something so beautiful about that about bringing people together and shared interests and so on yeah yeah there really is susan's just said that um there are a couple of andy goldsworthy sculptures in melbourne susan let me know the gps location of these sculptures (laughs) hopefully there's one in (laughs) warrandite Well, Alice, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being with us this this morning for for you and um, tonight for us. It's just been an absolute pleasure to to for one put a face behind your beautiful work and your books, publications, and I've just just loved getting to know you over the last couple of days. And we always ask our beautiful artists what you might like to be remembered for through your work or a quote or a saying or just just something that that you might like to to stand for as an artist what what would that be for you okay, so um Ange asked me this the other day and I was thinking oh I don't know what to say but actually <laughs> I remembered some somebody I don't know who said it but somebody said about my work they described it as um so I'm just gonna check get this right high octane simplicity and I just oh. thought that there's something really kind of captured in there because it I mean I've People often look at my work and think it it looks simple, but um, I mean actually it's not. <laughs> um, but but there is a simplicity perhaps to how I um, present things, um, and there's a simplicity when in in terms of kind of perhaps where the the materials have come from. Um, so I I just really love that high octane simplicity. So um, you know maybe somebody will remember my work for that. Oh. That's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I'll have to do an Instagram post on that one <laughs> eventually. <laughs> but it's just, yeah, as I said, it's just been absolutely wonderful meeting you. I know um, Tara Axford was lucky enough to come over and meet you in the UK. And finally, she's our Friday feature artist for next week. So, um, great. She goes, oh, my God, you put me after Alice. And I'm like, yes, we have. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she was, she was, that's how I actually found out about you was through um, through the lovely Tara Axford. So, yeah, it's, yeah, hopefully everybody out there um, share the love for Alice. Um, look her up on Instagram if you haven't already found her. Buy her books. Um, yeah, give her some love. But it's just been, yeah, absolutely. And if you ever do... <clears throat> come to Australia, please look us up. We'd love to show you around. Um, maybe we could go. Come next year. I was due to oh, come really? next year, but that's obviously, that's been uh, put back a couple of years. So, I, I mean, I will, I will get over there one day. Yeah. Yeah, please do. And Susan, Susan's going to take you to see Andy Goldsworthy's sculptures. Oh, so. great. I look forward to it, Susan. <laughs> yeah. I'll just tag along. I'll be like, carry your bags. <laughs> Um, so we'll play a little video now to say goodbye to Alice and please pop up your comments and say thank you to Alice for, for spending this hour and 17 minutes with us. That's just so generous of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank um, you for me. Yeah, no worries at all. And thanks, everybody, for watching and all your beautiful comments and questions too. It's just it's great to be back. We had a couple of weeks off and it's just been, yeah, it's really nice to be back in the chair and I call it a Friday night date because I get all dressed up and put makeup on and. <laughs> it's the only time during the week so thanks guys i really appreciate it thanks alice thank you